So to begin, I want to spend a few minutes discussing how this story fits within this burgeoning genre of literature in the mid to late 19th century. This genre relates to uh, another genre of literature called literary realism, but more precisely and more specifically, it's a genre of literature that attempts to interrogate these new working conditions in industrialized countries or countries that are becoming industrialized like the United States and in other parts of the world, such as Great Britain and England, for example. Writers like Charles Dickens certainly spent a fair number of pages interrogating working conditions, in particular for children, and the sorts of exploitation that was associated with those working conditions. This is also a short story that is concerned with working conditions for a class of people who were quite poor, as we see in the story. But it is also a story about immigrants. It's a story that wants to understand how this sense of industrialized exploitation doesn't just exist in this vacuum. There are these other considerations, such as the sorts of racism often associated with immigrants from other countries. We will speak, for example, about Aaron's Daughter, this poem that grapples with the working and living conditions of Irish immigrants. So... That is something worth just at least seeing and identifying as well. This isn't just about capital becoming the main economic and philosophical drive in industrial countries like the United States. There's more to it than that, and we cannot ignore and we cannot overlook how racism and class are certainly parts or composite parts of this larger problem, this larger form of exploitation. But before anything else, before we talk about particulars from the story, I want to say something about how this story is attached to or connected to or at least shares some conceptual DNA with a sort of literature called realism. And when I teach modern American literature, I talk more about literary realism and literary naturalism. But just broadly speaking, and this is a quick and dirty definition, but one of the best ways to think about literary realism is to imagine there was this history of literature in writing that attempted to uh, do not, not all literature does this, of course, but there's this history of writing, these canonical texts that grappled with and dramatized the lives of those who many people would call the exceptions among us, or these exceptional individuals, like kings and queens, princes and princesses. So if you read Life in the Iron Mills closely, that is not what this story is about, This is not about the life of a king or a queen, even though there are some upper or middle upper class characters who have a place in the narrative, but the narrative isn't about them. There are these other ways of writing and these other modalities, such as literary sentimentalism and romanticism. And what I ultimately mean by that is, and again, I'm playing fast and loose with these terms for the purposes of this lecture, but sentimental literature, while obviously there are problems and conflicts in those narratives, you can imagine there's always a happy ending of sorts. A lot of Jane Austen's novels fit within this sentimental, romantic, genre. And when I say romantic, there's a difference between romanticism and romance. When thinking about literary romanticism, I want you to imagine the sorts of texts that have these gothic, mysterious, and supernatural elements. Think about writers like Edgar Allan Poe and Nathaniel Hawthorne. But this is a story that doesn't feel like either of those. If you're familiar with Jane Austen, you know that so many of Jane Austen's novels, even though she's an English writer, so many of her novels have these happy endings. There's something quite sentimental, something quite saccharine about them. And if you read the short stories of Edgar Allan Poe and Nathaniel Hawthorne, you know there are all of these gothic supernatural elements that are difficult, if not impossible, to explain. And literary realism, while it may not necessarily reject those sorts of ideas and sensibilities, it's certainly not preoccupied with them in the same way. This story, for example, doesn't have a happy ending. There's no way of explaining the phenomena in the story by gesturing towards supernatural or gothic elements or tropes. 
all of this feels, and I think this is a mistake a lot of people make when they talk about realism. They think, well, it's just this unmediated reflection of what life is. All of this feels like, hey, you're just getting life the way it is. And that, of course, is not true because there is a narrator here. There is a form of mediation. There's something between us and what's dramatized in the text. But when thinking about what it means for something to be realistic or to hew closely to literary realism, again, just think this is not sentimental. This is not gothic. This is not romantic. This doesn't have these spiritual or supernatural elements to it. It's quite grounded. And that's maybe the word that I like to use. Plus, notice the prose. It doesn't have this kind of elevated exaltation. The prose mirrors the lives of these characters and the spaces they occupy. And you can even argue that the use of dialect, the way, for example, Davis uses dialect in this story, is a way of hewing closely to something more realistic. This kind of dialect, some of it, some of it, wants to show a reader the phonetics of particular forms of speech, what, for example, an Irish or a Welsh immigrant may sound like. And this is something that happens in African-American literature a lot, even though we didn't see this in, or even though we won't see this in Frederick Douglass. The use of slave dialect as a way of showing a reader something akin to authenticity, or, or these sorts of writers use this slave dialect as a way of gesturing towards authenticity. So again, the point maybe in summation is, don't think that literary realism has this unmediated approach, or that there aren't degrees of mediation like there might be in other genres, like romanticism, like more sentimental texts such as William Shakespeare's Hamlet, a play that collects a lot of those different genre trappings. There certainly is mediation, but what the writer and what the speaker, what the narrator is ultimately preoccupied with, rejects a lot of the ideas associated with sentimental writing, with romantic or romanticism, or even with some of these older, more antiquated canonical texts that suggest the heroes of our world and the sorts of figures who are fodder for literature are, again, these kings and queens, these characters who occupy this exclusive space on a social spectrum of some kind. But back to what I said a moment ago about how there's no happy ending. I think we have a clear sense of this at the beginning, and just mark the overarching sense of dread that permeates this space. This is brought to our attention in a rather clear and acute way at the beginning of the story. I'll just read a bit from the first two paragraphs. A cloudy day. Do you know what that is in a town of iron works? The sky sink down before dawn, muddy, flat, immovable. The air is thick, clammy with the breath of crowded human beings. It stifles me. I open the window and look out, can scarcely see through the rain. The grocer shop opposite, where a crowd of drunken Irishmen are puffing Lynchburg tobacco in their pipes. I can detect the scent through all the fall smells, reaching loose in the air. The idiosyncrasies of this town is smoke. It rolls suddenly in slow folds from the great chimneys of the iron foundries and settles down in black, slimy pools on the muddy streets. Smoke on the wharves, smoke on the dingy boats, on the yellow river, clinging in a coating of grease soot to the house front, the two faded poplars, the faces of the passers-by, the long train of mules dragging masses of pig iron through the narrow street have a foul vapor hanging to their reeking sides. Here inside is a little broken figure of an angel pointing upward from the mantel shelf, but even its wings are covered with smoke, clotted and black smoke everywhere. A dirty canary chirps desolately in the cage beside me. Its dream of green fields and sunshine is a very old dream, almost worn out, I think. So a couple of important details here. Again, this sense that this industrialization, this move toward industry, toward machines, this kind of hyper-mechanized way of imagining work, just the effects that it has both on the environment and on the individual. And I think this is one of those moments where a writer like Davis, she 
certainly she's certainly writing about working and living conditions in an industrialized or a burgeoning industrialized capitalist place or space. But this is something, to be quite frank with you, that we're we're even reckoning with today, even now, the way industry has these negative effects on the environment. We just see it again all over these opening paragraphs. Smoke, it's smoke. It's everywhere in the air. There's no there's no greenery, there's no open fields, there's no clear spaces. Everything is just infected by the smoke that this new industrialized economy produces. And of course, that is not to say that the industrial period and industrialization didn't produce positive effects. I think part of Davis's point is that there are just consequences. Maybe there are even things that we don't see, things that are overlooked, and in particular for her, the way workers are treated and thought about. Think about, for example, just as a way of connecting some of the things we read near the end of the story to what we see here at the beginning of the story. And this is on page 1717, the doctor who had this exchange. And I'll come back to this in just a moment with Hugh Wolf. He describes to his wife something he reads in the newspaper about how Wolf has been sentenced to this long prison term for this theft or this presumed theft. My dear, you remember that man I told you of, that we saw at Kirby's Mill, that was arrested for robbing Mitchell. Here he is, just listen. Circuit Court, Judge Day, Hugh Wolf, operative in Kirby and Johns, Loudon Mills, charge, grand larceny, sentence, 19 years hard labor in penitentiary, scoundrel serves him right after all our kindness that night picking mitchell's pocket at the very time his wife said something about the ingratitude of that kind of people and then they began to talk of something else so this word ingratitude i would argue is extremely important but more than anything i would argue what davis wants us to recognize is just how little this doctor and by extension his wife really understand about the lives of figures like wolf and how they ultimately just rely on an oversimplified idea and notion about individuals or oversimplified ideas and notions about individuals who live and exist in this particular class But again, I think it's important to acknowledge there may be an element of anti-immigrant racism and xenophobia attached to this scene. But my larger point is that for a writer like Davis, a moment like this is so important and so revealing because it shows what individuals in positions of power and influence ultimately think about someone like Wolf and what someone like Wolf represents, his motivations, etc., but while this story is not but while this story is not conventional in the way that sentimental literature is and in the way that romanticism and literature within romanticism is there is this moment for wolf when he starts to understand the degree to which he's been interpolated into this system and this way of thinking about himself So I just used this term interpolated, and I wanted to spend a moment defining and explaining what it means. I think the best way to think about it is to imagine you are walking down the street, and you hear a police officer shout, Hey you, stop. And I think maybe even for us today, maybe it's not walking down the street so much. Maybe it's as we're driving and we see those police lights in our mirror. And I think for a lot of us, our immediate assumption is, my God, I've done something wrong. Or maybe the question is, what have I done wrong? And that is a moment of interpolation because you've been, you've been without your consent, you've been pulled or pushed into this way of thinking, into this system of thinking by this very real but also symbolic authority figure. And for a character like Wolf, maybe the most transcendent moment or perhaps even the most revealing moment is when he starts to understand the degree to which he's been interpolated. And, and this is important, he actively fights against it. And I think there's a way that Davis shows us both this dynamic through content and through form. So I wanted to read a fair amount here from pages 1712 and 1713. So it came before him, his life that night, 
the slow tides of pain. He had borne, gathered themselves up, and surged against his soul, his squalid daily life, the brutal coarseness eating into his brain as the ashes into his skin. Before these things had been a dull aching into his consciousness. Tonight, they were reality. He gripped the filthy red shirt that clung stiff with soot about him and tore it savagely from his arm. The flesh beneath was muddy with grease and ashes, and the heart beneath that, and the soul, God knows. And then later, near the bottom of the page. Able to speak, to know what was best to raise these men and women working at his side up with him, sometimes he forgot this to find hope in the frantic anguish, to escape, only to escape out of the wet, the pain, the ashes, somewhere, anywhere, and for one moment a free air on a hillside to lie down and let a sick soul throb itself out in the sunshine. But tonight he panted. For life. The savage strength of his nature was roused. His cry was fierce to God for justice. Look at me, he said to Deborah with a low, bitter laugh, striking his puny chest savagely. What am I worth, Deb? Is it my fault that I am not better? My fault, my fault. He stopped, stung with a sudden remorse, seeing his hunchback shape writhing with sobs. For Deborah was crying, thankless tears, according to the fashion of women. And then I want you to notice what happens. He dips back into dialect. God forgive me, woman. Things go harder when you nor me. It's a worse share. So a couple of things here. A moment ago, I was talking about interpolation and how perhaps for us, it's that moment when we, when we see the police lights as we're driving in our rear view mirror. And at that exact moment, I think for a lot of us, our impulse is to think I've done something wrong. And that's a moment where we are interpolated into a way of thinking. And what Wolf has alternatively understood here in the passages that I've read is that he too is a figure of interpolation. He has experienced interpolation. But what is potentially transcendent and what is potentially great about this moment is that he's developed a kind of consciousness about it. And perhaps even a Marxist critic, or if you wanted to do a Marxist reading, someone like that might suggest that what he's experienced is class consciousness. He's developed class consciousness. He understands himself in the world in ways that he didn't before and perhaps couldn't before. And many would argue that this is part of what this social and economic system does. It actually places workers like Wolf in a position where he's unaware of his place. And he's unaware of the forms of exploitation he suffers. This is something, for example, that Frederick Douglass writes about. There were times when he was brutalized so much that he couldn't even think about the degree to which he suffered. And he suffered horrendous objectification. But this is a moment where Wolf emerges out of this, and it's interesting how for Davis, she actually shows us this, not just on the page, but she makes an interesting formal choice, because notice how for a moment, Wolf is not speaking in dialect. He's actually speaking a language that feels maybe more middle class or, or just outside of that dialect. Maybe there's a degree of education to the way he sounds for a moment. I guess the point is, it's not a kind of dialect, and I would just encourage you to pause for for a moment and think what is significant about this because again this is not a sentimental story this is not a story where wolf has a happy ending this is a tragedy this is a tragedy in the worst kind of way and maybe part of what allows it to seem more like a tragedy is that he has this moment but it's stolen from him and his fate is to commit suicide in a prison after basically losing his mind because of these conditions that he was subjected to in prison. But I think this is an important moment because this is a moment, and I think this is part of Davis's point. This is a moment where a worker like Wolf sees and understands the world around him in ways that he's frankly not encouraged to. Because if every worker like Wolf saw and understand 
saw and understood, the degree to which he and they suffered objectification at the hands of their capitalist bosses, they would potentially revolt. So there's an incentive for the individuals who own these sorts of iron mills, and you can just substitute any sort of industrialized, mechanized system or job, working environments, factories, even for us today, call centers, etc. But what's fascinating about a figure like Wolf, again, is that he is in many ways unlike those around him. And we are made aware of this, or Davis makes us aware of this with this statue that he forms from these discarded materials at the iron mill. And the narrator even suggests that he's someone who he is so different, in fact, from his co-workers or the people that he occupies this working space with. They just deride him for this, and they poke and they prod him for this. But what's fascinating, I would argue, about Wolf is that when this is brought to his attention, that he is different, that there's something quite wonderful about the sculpture that he made, instead of just, I don't know, taking the compliment Ignoring what Dr. Mitchell says, he actually asks for help. The doctor even says to him, they have this brief exchange or this brief conversation with the doctor when he, when he says, you could be more than this, right? You know, you could, be, you could be a sculptor of the highest order if only you could find a way out, if you could do that. And he asks for help, but there seems to be no one there to help him which I would argue this is Davis offering yet another clear and unambiguous indictment of this system. If we have a system where workers are so dependent on these forms of exploitation, what does it say about the system itself? How was this moment when, perhaps to our surprise and maybe even to the doctor's surprise, he asks for help, how is that a challenge to the system? And what are we left to make of this? But I think I'll close by saying a quick something about the sculpture that he makes. And again, I think it's on a metaphoric and symbolic level important to say and acknowledge that he creates and produces this bit of culture, this this sculpture out of discarded materials. Because I think for someone like Davis, she might say or agree that, well, workers like Wolf are these disposable, discarded materials. They're just workers. So who cares? But when asked what does it mean, or when asked to offer something of an authorial statement, all he says, in effect, is, she's hungry. And there's this moment when part of this cohort touring this mill, one of them is a reporter, we know one is a doctor, and there are several others who might be there for an investment opportunity. This was actually quite common at the time, offering people these tours of these factories as a way of showing how industrialization is an unambiguously good thing. And this was a way of perhaps currying favor for these potential investors. But many in this cohort actually misinterpret it. And they say, well, my God, you know, she's hungry. She should probably look a little more physically dilapidated. But it's clear that, again, Wolf Maybe he's showing how unique and how special he is because her hunger, it's more metaphoric. Maybe it's an existential hunger. But what I think is important is that no one seems to have a good answer to this. Even when the doctor offers an answer, it's one that within context is quite dissatisfying. And I'm here on 1710, and I'll read over to 1711. Do you know, boy, you have it in you to be a great sculptor, a great man. Do you understand talking down to the capacity of his hearer? It is a way people have with children and men like Wolf to live a better, stronger life than I or Mr. Kirby here. A man may make himself anything he chooses. God has given you stronger powers than many men. Me, for instance. And my God, what I think is interesting here, and we often hear this kind of idea bandied about today, if you are dissatisfied with your situation in life, well, damn it, do something about it. Make a change. But I think what Davis shows and what Davis reveals is actually quite smart and is a challenge to this idea. To just say to someone, make whatever you want of yourself. Just be yourself. Ignore the sorts of social, political, and economic conditions that prevent many people from making whatever they want of themselves. And you could almost imagine that a moment like this for Davis is a direct challenge to transcendentalism, which we'll talk about 
in a few weeks. That is to say, Davis suggests that the individual, I'm sorry, doesn't have nearly as much power as we like to think. That's more of a myth or an idea than anything else. And it's perhaps not as true as we like to think because look at a figure like Wolf. Is it really true? Is it really possible that if he just had a stronger will, if he just decided one morning I'll do better, that he could and would do better? I think all of us, especially after reading this story, might find that idea quite laughable. And I think for a writer like Davis, she too finds it quite laughable. So part of what we see here are the traces of this idea that still lingers with us today. Nearly 150 years later, we are still attempting to answer this idea the doctor introduces to Wolf. In this moment, we're still attempting to challenge and contextualize how at times implausible it is for an individual to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. For Davis, we must consider, we must reckon with the social, political, economic, and even when thinking about the particulars of this moment that we live in, the biological and global conditions that we are all subjected to that inform our lives. And that is what I would argue is one of the most enduring components or aspects of Davis's story. In the mid-19th century, she attempted to, through this narrative, through this story, interrogate the fallacious nature of an idea that many of us still grapple with and still attempt to challenge. Again, what are the limits? And for someone like the doctor, he seems to think there are no limits. But what are the limits of an individual's ability to affect positive change in their lives? So, with that said... While I could say far more about the story, I think I'll stop there for time purposes. Again, I hope you enjoyed these two texts. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me. So for Early American Literature, this is Colin Cox. I hope all of you have a wonderful day.